Just a quick little announcement that this Monday, October 21st at 7 p.m., Monday Night Live will return with the crew from Bass and Beer Radio. We're going to be talking about all things fishing and also getting a fishing report on how the Upper Bay is fishing right now. Again, Monday Night Live returns this Monday night, October 21st at 7 p.m. Bring your questions. I'll be giving away gift cards to some of the best questions asked. It's going to be a great time. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we're heading back on up to the Pennsylvania Susquehanna River area with the Mid-Atlantic Kayak Organization. We got Jake, we have Dan for the Tournament of Champions. How are you guys doing? Great, Good, Thomas. So, Jake, I mean, really just to tee this off for the crowd to get them really, um, you know, tantalized with this, what specifically is the Tournament of Champions? Is this kind of like your AOI championship, basically? So, yeah. So, every year um, we have a Tournament of Champions, and it, and you have to qualify to get into this tournament, which means you've either had to win a tournament or you have to finish in a certain, the top number of points um, to make to to make this this tournament. It's a zero entry, zero dollar entry fee. First place pays out this year, paid out a thousand. Second place paid out 500. Third place paid out 300. Um, it also can be utilized if you, if you are in the angler of the year race, it can also be utilized as one of your um, five events required for the angler of the year race. So naturally, anybody that's in the angler of the year race and a chance to win has an opportunity to fish the TOC and improve their standings based on, on where they finish. Because I mean, there's only, there was only 50, I think 12 people that qualified that could make this event. So your chances of doing well in that event is a lot, a lot better. Right. But the other part of it is that it's everybody that has fished consistently all year long, finally on the same body of water against each other which was the mindset that you know, that we have. So it's tournament of champions, but it's also an angler of the year, end of year, last tournament um, where we crown our, our angler of the year and such um, all of our prizes and stuff. The, the big giveaways we do there at the TOC. Um, and it's that's that's a reward for fishing. Well, it's a reward for anybody that fished well throughout the year to make it to that event. And I mean, zero dollar entry fee and you can win a thousand dollars and you're fishing against no more than 15 people. That's that's good numbers. Um, so it's it's kind of a it's it's a special event that we had. And and Dan, Dan, fortunately, won it. So were there any boundaries? Your, your bad luck. Bad uh, luck. <laughs> my bad luck. I my day. Yeah. Yeah. So as we set the table for this event, um, who were just to make sure we, we give good, a good plug for them. Who were the sponsors of this event that you had? So to work the with big them? sponsors for this event was um, Delaware paddle sports, and they've been a major sponsor of the series for years, but they also sponsor our angler of the year. And um, the other was uh, Newport vessels. So Newport vessels stepped up with a motor package for the angler of the year. They also sponsored us. Um, in other other ways as well, uh, they were a huge supporter this year of the series. Um, BioNO batteries, dude, we gave away we we gave away probably I'm gonna guess and say like five thousand dollars worth of batteries at the TOC. Mm. Um, there were two two 24 volt 50 amp hour batteries, one that went with the Angler of the Year motor package. Um, another one that I believe you won, wasn't it, Dan? Wasn't that the one yeah. you won? Yeah. Uh, as And that was like a prize, I think, wasn't it? What was that? Was that like a door prize drawing? No, I think that was part of my prize package. Okay, it could have been. I'm not, I don't know that for sure. But either way, BioNO hugely stepped up sponsoring the series. The two 24-volt 50s, and then there was also... Um, two 12 volt fifties that they gave away at the TOC that, you know, gave us to give away at the TOC, um, yak power, power, like power distribution systems. They, they played a big part. Um, oh gosh, I know I'm probably forgetting somebody. I mean, 
the taxidermist out in Western Maryland, nature's best wildlife artistry. They did, they sponsored all of our checks for the entire year. Um, so they were, you know, they were a big supporter that call that all culminated right there at the TOC. But um, those were the major ones for sure. As we lead up into this event, was there any boundaries that we set? I know uh, if you guys haven't seen, it, I had Jake on, we were just shooting the shit last time he was on here talking about how different tournaments potentially you might have to like put boundaries. So they're not fishing up into where the Susquehanna dumps into the uh, Potomac or what was the area that they were allowed to fish? So for this specific event, because of the low number of entrants that we had uh, participants um, we, we decreased the size, the amount of water that was available to the anglers. Um, 12, we were expecting like 15, 12 to 50 or 10 to 15 people. We ended up with 12 and we went basically from the dock street dam in Harrisburg to the Goldsboro dam, which is basically one pool of water. Mm. It's considerably less. I think it's maybe, I think miles wise, it might be like six and a half miles, maybe, maybe less. Um, but there's a lot of water in play in that stretch. And there's also very good largemouth fishing on top of very good smallmouth fishing in that stretch. So we, we opted for that stretch of water mostly because of the different opportunities that were presented. You could go fish grass like you would fish on the Potomac. Or you could go up and fish rocks like you would fish in the upper sections of the river. Um, there is a lot of different differing opportunities there uh, presented in that one small stretch of river that we chose. So the stage is really set. So, I mean, Dan, going into this event, knowing the arena you get to play out of, how did you prepare for it? Um, as, as with my third place finish on the Conowingo pool, my pre-fishing bombed. I absolutely sucked on that stretch of river. I hit it three times. And ultimately on, on day one, I ended up fishing water I had never fished before because it was just, I was clueless. I just, I bumbled around until I found some water, found some fish, and then exploited them over and over and over again. <laughs> I mean, that is a strategy, probably not the best kids. If you're listening at home, just to just <laughs> <laughs> fall, fall into it. It's probably um, a little better than my strategy though. So didn't you win one of the days or something like that? I, I saw you at the top of the leaderboard well, for something. You can, you can win day one and it doesn't mean anything if it's a two day tournament. So that's true. Um, I ended up with 89 inches on day one and I, that wasn't, it wasn't didn't come easy. Like I had probably 87 inches by like 830 in the morning. And then I got one upgrade way late in the day. Um, but my pre fishing strategy was I didn't go near the water at all. Um, I just stayed completely away from it. But I also lived 10 minutes from the closest boat ramp to that that part mm. of the river. So I knew the water pretty well. But I will say that the water right now is different than it has been for probably five to maybe even more years ago because they are actually in the process of lowering um, the water levels in the Goldsboro pool so they can work on the York Haven Dam. So they're running straight water out of York Haven Dam, which really decreased the amount of water in the Goldsboro pool, which really affected the upper stretches and made it where like the Harrisburg gauge was reading 3.5, but it was probably closer to like a 3.25 foot river mm. um, in the stretches where we were fishing. So it just, it was, it was a little different, but I mean, it just shallow. Were you guys dealing then with like, was the water at a stable level the whole event or leading into practice? Was it continually fluctuating? No, it's pretty, it was stable the entire, the entire week. We, we need, like, we still need rain. We need, we need. <laughs> That's fascinating I, to me. That's really yeah. is. Cause, um, you know, again, for you guys that don't know, they're listening in, like, you know, I'm in the, really the Hagerstown area and everyone that I live with, uh, down in Virginia got just shat on cause of the storm that came through, wiped out all the new river basin. The Shenandoah river got blown the hell out too. I think a lot of the boat ramps, a lot of them are still like, they're just caked in mud. Like they're asking yeah. the state to do something about it, but the upper Potomac, pretty fine and the susquehanna it's just so weird how it just if it just moved maybe what 10 
30 miles, you know, uh, yeah. northeast, what that would have done. Cause that might probably would have given you a little too much rain, honestly. So it was weird because the week prior to the event, we got probably, oh, it was, it was week, a week long worth of rain, but none of that rain was like torrential downpour. It was like, mm. a busy, you know, just a steady rain. And we didn't get, I w- what I was hoping we would get would be like, a lot of water and i was hoping we'd have like a two or three foot jump in river levels but we didn't get that if we would have had that the tournament would have it would have taken 97 to 98 inches per day to win um but those at least i don't know what what dan's gonna talk about as far as his experience but i know for me um i had a low light morning bite that i could count on And then after that, you were looking for fish with their backs out of the water and super shallow gravel bars. And if you could get close to them without spooking them, you might be able to catch them. But if not, then they weren't catchable. But yeah, Dan, like I throw it to you then, like just just day one, like you said, you had a terrible practice. You just kind of roll out of bed and see what happens. So what what happened? Well, my my third day of pre-fishing, I found fish, nothing over like, I mean, they were like program fish, all 15 inches. I saw some giants, so I thought, well, it's as good a place as any to start. So I went upriver, up towards the 83 bridge. And um, it was a drag race with two other guys that launched with me. And that area gets pretty small with a couple of guys. So I just, I shut my motor down, made a right, and just headed to water I didn't even know. And um, it was a grind. I mean, I, I caught a lot of small fish. I didn't have my first giant to, like... I don't know, 11 o'clock, maybe. And it was a grind after that. I, I saw one feeding from 100 yards down river. I turned around, went back. Lucky enough, found it. It hit. Um, hit a fluke. You, you, say at, you say at 11 o'clock you had your first big one. Was that your first keeper? Or where were you are limit-wise at 11? No, you're asking my 50-year-old, 54-year-old brain to recall that. Um one fish, two fish, three fish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to stuck in my head later. <laughs> um, yeah, I might have had a couple of smalls on my stringer. And then I added like an 18-incher, 18 and some change around 11 o'clock. And then about an hour later, I, I saw that one feeding and I went back and hit that. I think that was 18 and some change. Okay. So I had two big fish and maybe three small fish. I was in what, Jake, eighth place day one, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So you had about four. So, okay. And, and that's what's interesting about these tournaments is like, there's no more points technically. It's like, it's it. Like, this is it. It's not the yeah. first tournament of the year. And so it's kind of like a fish to win mentality, I'm assuming. So with four, are you just trying just to go for broke then? Like seeking these 18 inches versus oh, just throwing a limit yeah. together? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like sitting by the fire at my brother's house after day one, I looked at him. I said, I need a couple of guys, including Jay Karshman, to fall flat on their face. <laughs> I did. And, and, Unbeknownst to me, he was dealing with a boat tournament downriver. That was the perfect storm for me. And I found fish right off the bat. I had I had a 19 and an 18 and a half mm. by like 9 o'clock, maybe even before that. Should have had more. It was Jake hit it on the nail on the head. These fish were so spooky. Day one, I floated up onto a, a push water on the top of an island and scared a bunch of fish, total rookie moment. And I, I just made mental note of that spot, came back day two, and I came up from downriver, tethered my kayak, and um, I snuck up along the side of that island. I mean, Mission Impossible music playing in, the, in my head. And I cast a, a donkey rig into that pressure ridge while fish are feeding, and they just disappeared. It was hmm. like, poof, they were gone. And I worked that over for half an hour. With a, then I went down to a single fluke, wouldn't touch it, wouldn't touch a spook. Then I threw, um, I threw a wake bait and did manage to coax a 19-inch bass to hit my hit that. And 
I was off the races after that. I had a couple missed strikes on that wake bait, and then I put another one, 18 and a half or something like that, in my stringer. But an hour later on the wake bait, and then that was it. No more wake bait. That was like about that, 10 o'clock, the wake bait went away. That's crazy that they would spook from the donkey rig or a fluke on the top, but they'll hit a wake bait. It just seems like you would think they would at least be enticed by the fluke, but okay, maybe turn away from it, but not like spook from it. Well, I had a decision to make at that point, even after I caught that first big one, I knew the fish were still there. Do I hold out and see if they reset, see if they get comfortable, or do I move on uh, and fish the water that I'd fished day one? Because I knew there was fish there. Mm. So I took off. I moved. So it's just a roll of the dice, and it paid off. Was there a water clarity difference, you think, or something different in those two groups of fish? No. No, it was about the same as day one. Um, the only thing at day one, I noticed we got a little bit of a stain when the, when the wind really kicked and I figured that was just weeds and everything was getting a little turned up, but day two, that wind laid down, which helped, hmm. um, day one was, it was too windy. There was yeah, day, more than one F bomb out of my mouth on day one, trying to deal with that wind. <laughs> day one was pretty brutal. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. <clears throat> when that wind picked up after the morning, like I had a very good morning bite that I that I could count on. I was fishing, like I, I don't care. I was fishing adjacent to Harrisburg Airport, um, basically floating down, casting. Um, there's like little, there's little mounds and stuff that happen that happen to just kind of be there, and I was catching fish off of that. Had my limit off of that, and as soon as I got away, you know, basically down to the end of the airport that wind picked up and it was blowing like straight up river. It was kind of mm. stupid the way it was blowing kind of up river and across a little bit. But, um, I, after I got a decent limit, I tied on a giant bait and tried to get a fish bigger than Mickey's 21 and a half that he ended up winning big bass for the year with. And I threw that for a large portion of the day with the wind, I was letting the wind blow me up river, just casting this huge glide bait, just woo, way out there and just working it back. And I didn't get a lot of play on that. It was, it was weird. It was weird how the fish weren't, they just weren't in, interested in like in a whole lot. And what I saw, one thing I saw on day one that was, very interesting and unique and I, I haven't I haven't seen it very many times before but there were there were fish that were laying on their sides like not up and down you know normal orientation they like they were literally laying on their sides and I cruised up I got blown up on one and I saw it and I it saw it laying there and I was like man I'm like that's a dead fish and I got almost right over top of it and then it just got up and and swam away really quick and i'm like what hmm. like that was weird <laughs> like it like it was never seen anything laying, like that <laughs> yeah it was like laying on its side and it and i couldn't explain like i didn't have an explanation in my head as to why it was happening but i i kind of just like i accepted it as being part of the day just being a really weird day um but yeah, I think day two, I, they were even more spooky. I mean, the fish were so spooky this weekend or that weekend. Um, day two was, you know, incredibly tough for me because I went back to where I thought I was going to get my limit again. And I really only needed a limit. Um, I thought I was going to get my limit. And I ended up floating behind two boats that had taken off from the boat ramp about 10 minutes before we did. And I ended up picking up one behind them, but dude, I struggled almost all day long on day two until I came across a pot of fish where I caught a couple. Then I spooked that group, couldn't get them to eat again. Um, 259, one minute before lines out, <laughs> I had a 18 inch plus inch fish hooked beside the boat. And that was my limit fish that I, hmm. that I didn't land. But I saw yeah, your video. Flat I saw your screen. video. <laughs> I was like, "Oh man, that was that was the fish that would have beat me for sure." <laughs> yeah, that that was that was the difference between a thousand dollars and zero dollars. 
you, you mentioned the wind was blowing really hard up. And I see this a lot like on the tidal and like the Shenandoah River where you can stop the tide with the right wind and you can also like really slow the current down the Shenandoah River if the wind's blowing straight up. Do you think it, it had to do with the difference in the current? Like if the wind was blowing down river, do you think that would have changed the bite at all? Yeah, I do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I mean, th- these fish, these fish are used to being in that kind of current. So when that when that wind's blowing directly up river and it's slowing it all down, and then on top of that, there being less water there than there normally is anyway because of the drawdown, I really think that a, a combination of of the wind up river, the low water levels because of the drawdown, the bluebird sunny skies, mm. I I don't think that Saturday was a day that many people were going to catch big fish, and, and some were caught, but I I just don't feel like it it was like not the type of day that was a, a great day for fishing. How much did that boat tournament affect it? Oh, for me, a lot. They floated directly over my juice. They was it everyone in your I section or just you? What's I, that? Bar- I barely saw a boat in my neck of the woods. That's crazy. That's, but well, there's a reason where I was that. fishing. Was, <laughs> there, it was really bony. So if somebody was coming up there, they were desperate to find fish in a boat. Yeah. So it's coming with kayak. The guys that launched out of my boat ramp all stayed within like a mile of my boat ramp. And that's not <laughs> good for, for, for a kayak fisherman because our, our range is not as great as a boat's. But yeah, right. those guys, I mean, there was like 10, I think 10 or 12 boats that launched in their tournament. And two of them went directly down river from where I was launched at. And they, they, the, like, they literally floated on my juice. And I, I, I don't know. I probably should have went somewhere else, but I, I made a gentleman's agreement with another angler and said that, you know, I wasn't going to go and fish where he was fishing, which was my B spot because it would have messed him up. So due to that gentleman's agreement, I stayed the course and figured I could pick up fish behind those boats and it just didn't happen. Why do you think the boats didn't run up there? You said skin, you say like the fishing wasn't as is dynamite up where you are or just like there wasn't enough water to get up there it's not enough water, enough water. Enough yeah. water. gotcha gotcha yeah, no the fishing where where dan was fishing at i fished i fish a lot up there and it's great when the water is really low because no boats i mean it takes it takes a pretty fancy jet boat driver to get up there and it takes somebody who really knows that water to get up there I, i'm not that fancy. <laughs> i would have beached this shit like i know how to go and i still would have beached my shit <laughs> Case, case in point, I'm fishing a big eel trap wall and ledge combination thing. I'm on the top of it where I limit. Actually, I caught, I caught the rest of my limit on day two at that spot. And here comes a G3 down river, and he was like hauling ass. So I assume he was one of the tournament fishermen. And he came up. He shut down because he saw the current. He saw the rapids, and he took one look at the eel trap. And he turned around, went back up river, went around the island. Yeah, <laughs> he wasn't mm. going to take a chance. But so yeah, that's all river jet go over that eel traps the day before, and he had no issues. Wow. So was this uh, your three D chess plan then, Dan? Was to go up there day two because of the fishing tournament? No, uh, I had no idea there was a tournament down river until neither uh, did I <laughs> until the awards, and I heard Jay <laughs> talking about that because. I was, I kept looking at the standings up until two o'clock and I'm thinking either Jake's had been some really bad luck today or he's sandbagging and he's waiting to register his fish till after the, the standings are off. So I had no idea what was going on after two o'clock. I was hoping he was having a bad day. No offense, Jake, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I didn't know there was a boat tournament going on. I just went day one where I fished, I fished maybe a quarter mile of river, half mile tops. And any tournament I go into, um, my ho- my goal is have fun. Don't leave active fish and fish your strengths. And I'm a finesse fisherman. So there's usually some sort of soft plastic Ugh. in my hand. Ugh. And gross. I know Jake hates finesse. He's fast and furious. And that pays <laughs> off for him sometimes. But... You know, when everybody else is throwing ploppers, I'm throwing a Nico Helgramite. 
like in the Bassmaster. Oh my God. Everybody's throwing ploppers and fuzz baits, and I'm throwing a Nico 425. I still placed 33rd, which wasn't bad for finesse fishing, but I was determined to win that tournament just on finesse, just to Mm-mm. stuff everybody and say, yeah, you would you fit. To win this tournament. <laughs> you would fit so well down here in like the Shenandoah. Um, I have two guys. I have like, well, I have three guys that are like a thousand years old that come on and talk about smallmouth fishing. And they are, a couple of them are old school. They still use like four pound, either fluorocarbon or mono for their, their Helgramites and their tubes wow. and stuff. They'll use like these eight foot uh, spinning rods for casting distance. And like, they're super duper old school with it. And I don't know why the Helgramite still works, but damn it. If it does, it makes no sense. Oh, my brother, every time I send him pictures with a 425 hanging out of a 19-inch small mouse mouth, he's like, that stupid bait works. I'm like, yeah, it, <laughs> there's no denying it. <laughs> I got I got a real quick funny story for you about fishing in Harrisburg that applies to Helger bites. Um, there, was a, there was a homeless gentleman down in the river. <laughs> I knew this was going to start. <laughs> and me and my son... Me and my son were bank fishing down there. We were walking up through up the river, up the steps, just tossing whopper ploppers. And we were just having a, you know, having a good old time, catching some fish on top water. And the homeless gentleman walks down and he goes, You guys catching any fish? And I'm like, Yeah, we're catching a couple. He's like, Are you using Helgramites? And I was like, No, we're throwing top water. He's like, No. And he gets angry. And he's like, you got to throw Helgramites. And I'm like, we're going to keep throwing top water. And he's like, no. And he like, he balls his fist up. And he's like, I said, you got to throw Helgramites. And at that point in time, like, I kind of lifted my shirt and just kind of like showed my pistol. Like, buddy, just go. Just get the hell out of here. Because like, <laughs> this this homeless dude was really upset that we were not throwing Helgramites. Wow. That would be a fun report to say <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I Find out who he I, is. Thomas can have him on. Yeah, that'd be a great. Yeah, we should, I'll, you know what? Next, if he's not dead, I'll, <laughs> next time I see him, I'll 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 ask him to come on the podcast. But I'm oh probably going to have to give him a government phone with Wi-Fi. I don't know if it's going. We'll, we'll figure it out. Logistics. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But um, he was not very he was not very happy that we weren't using Helgramites. So. so, Nico, if you would like to sponsor Jake, uh, this would be the first uh, Glock oh, and Helgramite. Uh, <laughs> you, get, you know, I, I hit them up. God damn it. I, I hit Over them up for somebody. some free baits. And uh, they they basically turned me down because I'm not a touring pro. Mm. But it is what it is. I'll still buy their baits. They work. So between the Nico Helgramite and Undercover's um, Fluke, the little twitch well, undercover right, baits. That's really Those good. Are the two baits and Dave Kalita, dfkfishing.com. Um, that his glide bait or his wake bait, simply wake bait in black. Those three baits won me the tournament. I never understand why black works in clear water like that. It's like if you're growing up and you read like a Bassmaster magazine, but if you're like reading a Bassmaster magazine, like you wouldn't know that because they would say like clear water, you have to use like natural colors, all that crap. But my Ned rig, a black Ned rig works great. A black Helga might works great. A black bait. It works great. Shadows. It's shadows, man. It's shat. These fish feed, these fish feed in, in shallow water like that. Not, not so much based on colors, but they feed based on movement and you're going to get the best shadow out of a black bait. So if they catch a shadow moving out of the corner of their eye, it draws their attention to it. And once they commit most, a Susquehanna smallmouth, once it normally commits, it commits. Mm -hmm. They don't typically shy off once they commit. So if they, if they get a notion that something's there and they commit to it, just keep doing what you're doing until they get there and then hold on. Um, but that's why like any solid colors, whether it's black, white, like I really don't think color makes a big difference, especially with like top water and like crankbaits and stuff like that. Um, I really don't think it makes much of a difference up here. I think they feed based on movement and shadows and stuff like that. Like they, you know, I don't know. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm still one of those guys that believe in color. My brother's, like you, Jake, he's like, that color doesn't matter. Because I throw a natural Nico Helgramite, natural color. 
He's like, you should be throwing black. I'm like, no, black's not going to work. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. But in my mind, it's got to be a natural color. I feel like with certain things, it does. Like, again, like the trout bite. If you're using a, like a Huddleston trout, you got to match the trout. If you're doing a larvae fly hatch, I really feel like when they get hyper aware of that bite, like the cicada, what was that? Like two or three years ago that that was like a thing. You gotta have to, you have to match the cicada enough. Cause that's what they're like hyper fixated on. I so disagree. I disagree completely. Ooh. I think you could throw one of those damn hairy cubes at them in, in a cicada <laughs> bite and they'd eat that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to completely agree with Dan on that one. Cause my wife and I were walk, walking across the Clark's Ferry Bridge the year that they were having the cicada, that we had all the major cicadas, and we saw fish down in the river, and I, I was like, watch this, and I grabbed little pieces of gravel that were on the sidewalk on the bridge and just dropped them over, and sure enough, those smallmouth did not miss a beat. As soon as those pieces of gravel hit the water, they came over looking to see what the hell was there. They were going to eat it. They didn't care what it looked like. They didn't care what color, how big, how small. They saw a water disturbance. They they came over and there was like four big ones that were just like they came to where the where the gravel hit the water and then they're all just kind of like turning around looking different directions. So and maybe this is a large mouth versus a small mouth deal. A glide bait bite. When they're tracking that thing, what are they trying to make a decision on? What what are they trying to make a decision? Yeah, because if you're if they're looking like at a six seven inch glide, not the times that they truck it. I'm talking about when they're when they're watching that thing and they're they're behind it. Are they just deciding whether they're going to eat it or not? Is it that plain? Or are they looking at the color, the shape? What is going through their head to make them actually trigger? Because I think I'll, I'll be there. honest with you. I've I've fished a giant glide bait day one of the TOC. And that was the first and only time I fished a giant flag <laughs> bait. And I don't know when the next time will be. Because it's just, it's like I'm trying to throw a 10-inch bass back in the water. I don't, let's not unhook this. Let's throw it back in. Like I'm musky fishing. There's so, just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, I personally believe that if they're following a glide bait, if they're behind it, they're not, they don't give a shit what color it is. Huh. I think they're waiting for it to make a movement like it's trying to get away. Okay. Now, mm. I think if they if they see it from the side, then maybe sure, maybe the color will play a difference. I personally don't think anyone should ever make a glide bait that's not bone. I think the I think the only colors that anybody needs to have in their tackle box is bone, black, and green pumpkin. And if you have those three <laughs> colors, you're going to catch green them. pumpkin. That's it. You, Somebody, so, I mean, for some, I would love for someone to go out and just fish those three colors for the entire year and see how they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I'll put it this way: I get, I get red crankbaits. Like mm -hmm. I like to. Oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I get the. Um, I'm not going to say the brand. I'm not going to talk about the brand. I'll get a red crankbait and I'll I'll take a black sharpie marker and just color it black. And use that all spring, and I wreck fish all spring long on a on a sharpie red crankbait. And why do I get red? Because red seems to be the most common that everybody wants to sell. So whenever I go on eBay and find a bunch, oh, I got I got the fire crawl. That, that's mm -hmm. great. I'll buy it and then make it black. Interesting. Yeah, but there's <laughs> times fire crawl does work and it works well. I guess. It goes I back to that confidence pumpkin. thing too. I, I agree put with green that. Pumpkin trailers on the back of my fire crawl chatterbait. So, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've tried green pumpkin on the. No. I mean, I, I feel the same way. Trailers would. on my fire crawl jackhammer. Nope. Nope. <laughs> no need. I feel no the same need. way though with uh, <laughs> chartreuse crankbaits though. So. It's a ge it's a geographical thing. I think it's a geographical thing. I think if the further south you go, the warmer the water temperature is. I think in those areas where you're fishing in those types of fisheries, I think red is a huge player. I don't so much think that it's a huge player on the river. I think if you're throwing a red crankbait and you're getting bit, I think you could probably get bit on a brown crankbait. I think that they're eating. Mm -hmm. No doubt. I think that they're eating crawfish and they don't care what color they are. They just think it's a crawfish. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, and it really comes down to like the branding and stuff. I mean, you all know that uh, I fish like old school bandits you have to buy on eBay. It's like good luck finding them. But I think it's because the way they're made, they make a different vibration. I mean, that's why I have boxes of, of lipless that are not made anymore because I think each one sounds different. And I really think it's that over color probably that's going to be the triggering factor for moving baits. But a shaky head, a jig, a Helgramite, I don't know, like in my brain still... It's just, I think they will analyze that thing a little bit longer and, and maybe they don't, maybe they don't, but I don't know. You know what, you know what I like shaky head worms for? I like to cut the nose of them flat and then, and then screw them into the tail of my rat wake baits. Hmm. hmm. That's about all I use them for. Do you own a spinning rod? <laughs> I have two. <laughs> <laughs> I have two spinning rods. That's it. Two. Oh my God. Dude, I, I, have, I don't know how I, you do I probably it. have 20 or more casting rods, but I have two spinning rods, and I will break those out um, in November, and then I'll put them away after March. Mm. Mm. That's a way to live your life. I don't mm. think I could. It's, uh... a, it's a fun way to live your life. It's the right way to live your life. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. Sometimes when the river gets real shallow, at least like the Shenandoah parts of that, man, you can't, you're going to have to break out the, the ultralight stuff and to yeah. get the casting distance and not spook them. Stupid. Dan, what do you think about that? Terrible idea. Um, I think Jake and I should go out and fish in tough conditions <laughs> head to head. I'll fish <laughs> finesse. He fishes fast and furious. I'm okay with it. <laughs> well there you I'm go make, there's a, i'm gonna make i'm gonna make them eat there's a new uh a new show for your channel no we should do that for your channel you should have me and dan go live while we fish yep and then you, and then you sit there and narrate oh god no yeah yeah that's what people want to hear is actually me narrating you need to wear a don king uh <laughs> wig, though. I, i'll put it to you this way i, I thought you were that, going somewhere else for that costume but okay that's good <laughs> i can do that <laughs> if we do that i won't wear pants <laughs> well, let's put this on your TikTok. That's more of that kind of crowd, the blue uh, hair crowd. I think that they would enjoy that a little bit more. Um, I mean, last closing thought here, Dan, like, uh, cause I have so many smallmouth guys in the Shenandoah that fish Helgramites. Like, do you have like a, a setup with line? Do you prefer mono or fluorocarbon with your leader material? Fluoro 10 pound, 10 pound tattoo. Wow. On a, on a medium seven foot spinning rod. Medium, right now, yeah. the spinning rod of choice is just a, a hundred dollar Tatula medium. Yeah, that's about right. That's all you need. And you I, don't have to go to these six thousand dollar rods. I rig them on a on a yeah Z Man Bullet Pro one fifteenth ounce. Whew. Rig them sideways. Have you seen that? How they rig the rig the bait sideways? Hmm. Is it weedless still? Yeah. Well, sort of. Semi. <laughs> See, the problem with the Nico Helgramite is, and I made a video about how I rig them. It's on my YouTube channel, uh, Mike Fishing, as in I'm Mike Fishing, Mike Fishing. Um, Whoa, that sounds terrible. Problem with the Nico is it's a sticky rubber, and you gotta you gotta make a hole in it. And I use a little. If smelly somebody jelly puts a hole in my sticky rubber, I'm gonna be pissed. Well, as long as it ain't bleeding. <laughs> and this is how we got fishing the dmv canceled yeah it wouldn't be the first time it's better than that right. other show <laughs> that's interesting yeah because that that elastic man is is a pain in the butt to deal with when it comes to that but i can't believe that's so light for the susky and that's that's how i rigged the 425 the three inch i just put it on a a ned head exposed hook ned head mm. And I That's get stuck awesome. a lot, but I catch some big fish that way too. Really small. For some reason that works. Some days that works better than 425. Some days vice versa. Do you, do you make any of your own jig heads just to save some money because of how much you get snagged with fishing? That I style? don't. I just keep reloading my box with stuff that I order on the World Wide Web. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um I have I mean, to wait in my kayak is soft plastics. I could get rid I could stand to get rid of some of it actually. 
I mean, yeah, it's like that to me is the style I grew up on. This power fishing thing for smallmouth is something I'm getting used to because, again, Shenandoah Upper Potomac, a lot of it was just the Helgramite, the tube, the Ned Rig. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, I love this because it's the battle of two. You got the Jake mindset of ADHD, Neanderthal, just burning versus the swordsman who just kind of picks each rock apart. And both are working. The both will work. I'll be honest with you. Last, in the October Bassmaster last year, after I watched his videos, Jake's videos, and I started fishing a jackhammer, burning it hard, fishing up, up river. It opened a whole new world. I, I had rarely fished any of the blade baits before that. Then I started buying jackhammers and it was off to the races. And I, I started fishing it like Jake. And then I took his ideas and I made it my own. But fishing them fast and furious, I forget where it was. I saw some sort of study they did on how fast a smallmouth bass is. You can't get your bait away from them. They're going mm-hmm. to catch it. But I agree with that. Maybe you know, Jake, how fast does a small mouth go in short bursts, like 20 some miles an hour? Faster than me. <laughs> That's not, that doesn't say much, but yeah. No, so no, I mean, I, to, to that point, um, you know, I talked about this, I think, on a previous podcast. You know, I get so much shit. People give me so much shit on social media. Oh, you're fishing too fast. You're fishing too fast. And what I, I don't say it on the social media because I don't want to get my comments disabled and my posts taken down. But what I want to say is, do you fish here? If you don't fish here, if you don't fish for these fish, shut up. Like, because you're (laughs) stupid because there, no, I mean, I mean, I'm serious. Like there's, there's some proof to that, that, you know, some of even the most prominent guides on the river will tell you that they, they, burn their spinner baits so fast that the blades flutter across the top of the water. They don't even make it in into the water column. These fish feed on movement and they are faster than us. They are faster than us. There's only one fish that's stronger or two fish in this whole entire river that's stronger and faster and, and more intelligent. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the flathead and the muskie. Um, these fish are incredible in, in what they can do. And they are such good hunters And they're so fast and they're violent in the way that they attack things. Once they make a commitment to something, they are either going to catch it or they are going to die trying. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's their mindset. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I love to fish fast. It's one of the reasons why I love to power fish. And and I'll tell you right now, there are times of the year that power fishing will not work. And you know what I do? Watch power fishing on TV when that happens. (laughs) (laughs) So, <laughs> like like a golfer when it's snowing out i gotta watch like golf. It, it's just it's just not like i have i have no fun whatsoever sitting there with a spinning rod in my hand and i've been i've been on the river with jeff with jeff little and he's like all right so cast it out and then don't touch it and then i'm like sitting there and i'm like oh I'm like man i forgot to cut my fingernails today like oh man oh, i wonder what yeah. i should probably go home like i'm tired it's cold and I, I, I don't have fun. I don't enjoy myself doing that. So I just won't fish that way. See, I, I enjoy that bite. When when they hit the Nico and I've got just that slack line, and of course it's Tatsu, so you can you can feel them breathe on the bait. And you feel that thump. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, boom. Mm-hmm. Meets that 18-inch fish out of the water. Yeah. You know what you catch me doing in in in, in the wintertime is fishing a rigs and giant glide baits and just gliding them through the water and letting them almost fall to the bottom before I do it again. That's about the closest you're going to get to me finesse fishing. I'll have a, I'll have a spinning rod with a stupid Ned rig tied on it, but that's about it. (laughs) I mean, I think that's the best way to end this thing. Uh, Guys, let me know in the comment section down below, are you team power fishing or you team fairy wand? Uh, Both work for smallmouth. Definitely. Uh, Dan, uh, thank you for so much for coming on again, guys, uh, tournament of champions winner. What can we promote? What do you have coming up? We have the native big bass power hour. I don't know if that's going to, if this is going to air before that. I hope so. <laughs> it's that that's Saturday. So the native big bass power hour is on the river here on Saturday. And after that, the MAKBF season is done until 2025. Looking forward Dan. to it. Dan, you have a YouTube channel? 
Might go fishing. Might okay, go great promotion. There we go. Okay, that the end. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk a little bit more that's, about that, or is that it? <laughs> I don't have a big social media um, presence. I, every time I, I've, I've got my GoPro on the boat, and then I sit in my chair with a cup of hot tea, and I I, I open the app. Skinning rod. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it Mike and, Go fishing? Because all this footage of these giant fish I catch on on Nico Helgermites with my spinning rod, and I I hate editing, so I've got a lot of footage I've never even aired. So, <laughs> well, guys, I'm going to link that in the episode description along with all of his other social media. Uh, give Jake a follow too. He needs the uh, he needs to be adored uh, for him to keep pumping out some more content here. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.